uh, lately that have shown up in the news. Definitely Google Meet is there. They're, they're a strong player, but I think they do have um, some problems. Like you can't share your system audio. So if you have a video or something that you want to share with your students, um, Google Meet doesn't allow that to happen. Now, there are some extensions on Google Meet. One of the first things that I was um, disappointed with to see was that you can't get that nice grid view like you can, like you see there on the, uh, on the Zoom screen. You can't get that through Google Meet without using extensions. And so, like like anything Google, uh, they do have extensions out there that you can add functionality to uh, to make Google, Google Meet work better. Uh, and then Cisco WebEx is one that my son actually, is, his district is using. It's very secure. Uh, it's highly functional, kind of like the Zoom is. And uh, it has built-in polling. So as you're going along with your teacher lessons, you can be polling, uh, polling students, uh, asking them questions, kind of keeping that uh, this formative assessment and a quick check going along with your lesson. So I think Cisco WebEx is a decent one uh, to go with if I had to start all over again. But I don't. I think ultimately none of these platforms are really meant for the heavy lifting of online learning. And uh, I think if we're going to go forward, I think it's time for districts to maybe look into some of those professional learning platforms that are that are out there. Uh, that are more for like workplace trainings and those things, but they're designed for this type of work. Uh, I chose, we chose Google. And uh, the reason that I chose Google was because ultimately my students just had some familiarity with the Google Suite. We use uh, the Google Suite pretty heavily. So they're, you know, they're used to the Google Docs and, and uh, forms and all that stuff. And so adding this on in, in um, adding this on wasn't too difficult. They know where it's at in the waffle. They can, we call it the waffle, the, the grid up there where you can click on it and get all the, the apps down for your Google. The students were, were familiar with that. And so to say they just go up there and find Google Meet or go up there and find Google Hangouts, that's a, that's a pretty easy step. We, um, it's possible, I, I did ask my students which one they wanted because we did trial Zoom for about a week um, and they ended up saying that they wanted Google Suite, which was fine with me. Um, ultimately, they're, they're both pretty similar and, uh, and, and, and ultimately if it's one that my students feel a little more strongly about, then I'm gonna go with that. We were lucky enough to have one day to prepare when uh, before we left for online uh, home, for home learning. And uh, that one day I took to make sure that my students knew how to get on Google Hangouts, get on Google Meet and uh, find me and find each other. But one of the bigger reasons that I think I liked the, the Google Suite and to do all this together was that I could also integrate a calendar. My students don't usually use a, a calendar. They're, you know, fourth, fifth grade students. It's not something that they're used to. I think even high schoolers or middle schoolers, high schoolers could, could kind of benefit from having to having to create an agenda for themselves, having to create a calendar for themselves, set up, set up meetings with one another. And uh, the Google functionality built in with that and Hangouts and, uh, and Meet, it just kind of, it kind of all added up for me. So uh, we chose Google. So far it's working out pretty well. Um, like I said, the system audio is just a big stinker for me that I can't share that, but I'm using a dual microphone, kind of some workarounds that makes it happen. It sounds to me like Google, uh, from what they've told me, they're they're pretty close to releasing a system audio update for that. So uh, whatever works for you, I think really as long as you kind of stick with one thing. Obviously, switching back and forth on any of these tools will probably cause confusion and problems. But I also don't think it's too late to switch either. I think if you um, if you really had it in mind that hey, you know this is going to work out better, I don't think I don't think you should be too afraid right now to take a leap and uh, and make something happen. So now that you've got your, uh, your platform set up, how, how often are you gonna meet? Um, I think you have to strike a balance. I think um, the first week we were gone, I tried to meet with my students every day. Uh, once, once in the morning, once in the afternoon. Um, that, that was pretty tough. That, was, that wasn't very manageable from myself or my students. Um, you know, I, I'm sitting here at home, I have four little children. It's not easy for me to do that. My wife also works. Uh, I know that there's obviously I think everybody understands this, but you know that your students also have a lot of stuff going on. Maybe they're babysitting another kid. Maybe uh, like one of my students, maybe they're home alone and they don't really have that support. So um, you have to find that balance, structure and flexibility. Uh, but too, you know, you, you don't want it to be too much. You don't want it to push the students away. And I think that um, if you're if you're if you have a lot of demands and if you're if you're uh, if you're kind of presenting a very large workload with our students, I think you're likely to scare some of them away. And, uh, and I think at this point, we, we don't want those students to, to be scared away. It's, it's kind of like luring and a frightened squirrel. We really want them to, to come in and, uh, and, and feel comfortable and feel like this is a place that they can be. Um, I feel like, you know, we really need to promote our class. I feel like I'm in sales lately. I feel like I'm in sales. I, um, I am doing everything I can to make class fun. I have spirit weeks uh, pretty much 
every week and every day is a spirit day of some kind. We have uh, like a, the, you see on here, I have my favorite, my favorite cartoon anime Padlet. It was cartoon anime day. And so the students could come on and they could post something on Padlet to share that personal information. We've had, uh, we had hat day where students had to get on a Flipgrid and, and talk about their spring break and what was, you know, what was great about it. Um, I am in the Google Hangouts every single day. I feel like a carnival barker kind of like, come on, step right up, come on into class today. It's going to be great. Uh, I've got these five or six things happening. We've got some fun games. Um, I really feel like, like right now it's my job to, to, to almost, to almost be a more of a promoter of, of online learning and promoter of myself and my classroom and my brand. Uh, than anything else because ultimately if I get them into the room that's just step number one and right there then I can work on engagement I can work on learning but if they're not showing up um, that, that makes my life a lot more difficult right so using chat using social media uh, I'm using any tool I possibly can to promote it uh, and when the students come in right away I give them a poll like rank these pizza toppings from from you know least to worst. Um, I, I have, I'm using Classcraft and trying to give them points on Classcraft, which is more of a, you know, a middle school, elementary school type of a thing. Uh, I'm trying to give them ways to share. I'm trying to having, ha allowing them to socialize is a, is a huge incentive, I think, for students, especially middle school, high school students. They want that, that social aspect. And so if you can provide that and they know that you're going to provide that, uh, that's, that's a really big thing. As far as some things to think about, you know, obviously we have students with access problems, uh, students with no Wi-Fi, or students perhaps, uh, I had a couple of students, uh, parents tell me that, you know, they're sharing the Wi-Fi router with the next door neighbor and two of them have to work and it's just not a good time in the middle of the day to access. So what I've resolved myself to do is every single meeting that we have, I do record. I record and post to the playlist so students have that access. Um, my students, I had, it was really uh, April 1st, April Fool's Day, I had my principals uh, type up a, a really fancy letter that said that all of my students, all of our students at the school needed to uh, come to their meetings in their uniforms because we're a uniform school. And so um, we uh, I totally pulled a great prank on them. It was, it was live in the meeting and I recorded that meeting and uh, it got them pretty good. They were, they were, they were pretty upset and uh, I had even a couple emails from parents who were like, I was so upset, but then I realized it was a trick. Anyways, uh, so then I posted that I posted that meeting to the playlist and uh, basically had to, I got to relive the whole thing all over again as students started watching the videos who couldn't access the meeting. They would type up and say, what are you talking about? We have to wear uniforms. And then oh, a couple minutes later, oh, I get it. So, um, you know, some kids, uh, they just have stuff going on and we have to be understanding about that. And so if, you know, if, if you're posting directions or posting your lessons, um, I definitely am 100% sure to make sure that if there's something I'm asking of my students to do, like let's say uh, I'm asking them to use a new tool or I'm asking them to do something that they might not be familiar with, that I am creating uh, a, a video recording of how to do that step by step and posting it up in the playlists for them to see. Um, basically, uh, you know, I'm trying to be under the assumption that my students don't have any support at home and, and it's only 100% me. And so I think that has to temper a lot of what we do then. That I don't, I, you know, I can't expect that, I can't expect that support from parents, but then I also need to provide that support that, that ultimately I would be giving at, at school, but ultimately also that their parents could be giving them at home. So I'm um, trying to provide that. We have, a, we have busy households, so I'm trying to make sure that I'm flexible with my deadlines. The, I think the one tricky thing out there in the districts now is how do you hold students accountable or do you hold students accountable? And um, within the three districts right around me, there's three different models. One that says, you know, work being done right now will uh, will depend on your on your grade, your final grade. One that says, hey, there's nothing we can do right now. Anything you do right now will not affect your final grade. And I think ultimately the best thing is the competency based model, which which I'm lucky enough to have. It says, you know, you do work and that and that shows proficiency and, um, and that's how you're going to advance. If you know, obviously, if you're not doing the work, you're not showing proficiency, but time is not time is not the variable. Um, so uh, anyways, students, students are home alone and we have um, we have to open up some lines of support and communication. Uh, within with them and their families and that's my next step here uh, but uh, to mention that there are programs out there right now for uh, for parents and families who are in need uh, four of them are on the bottom there there's there's uh, everyone on there's the NDIA uh, NDIA is the, the National Digital Inclusion Alliance um, and some other places out there that provide these uh, you know low-cost alternatives for um, for broadband 
for broadband service and also for computers. I know our district is putting up hotspots around neighborhoods. Um, and if we can identify, you know, a, a couple of families in the same area that needs a hotspot, we're, we're, we're installing those. So trying to, trying to allow students to, uh, to access even when they can't access. Um, ultimately then, it's, it's a huge component is, is, is communication. How are you going to get information out to both parents and students? Um, being a parent and getting emails from my child's teacher, uh, the first email was quite overwhelming. There was a lot going on. I think, I think she emailed out five different days and, uh, of, of work to do and three subjects per day. And it was like a 13 page document. And I'm an educator and I, I felt overwhelmed by all of that that she sent out. Now, maybe, you know, maybe other teachers are different. Uh, or other parents would be different. I don't know. Um, I think it's important for us to make sure that we're sending out small bites small bites at a time, digestible bites, and knowing your parents and knowing your students uh, and knowing if they're the types that can handle that. You know, I, you do have some students who are always those go-getters who are going to want to do all five days on the first day uh, and then having those extra activities to do. And there's other some students who are, they just need those small digestible bites to be able to do, um, to do what they do. My principal always says, how, how are we going to, this is a horrible analogy, how are you going to eat an elephant? You're going to eat it one bite at a time. And I think sometimes that that's the way this feels of all of the stuff that we have to do. We really want to do it just one, one bite at a time, one piece at a time, one element at a time. Uh, Empower provides a really great tool for us to contact parents through emails. Uh, and it's up in the, uh, in the reporting tab. And it's over, uh, if you go down to the uh, class rosters, you can see where you can copy guardian emails. And then they've added this new tool where you can also copy student emails. And uh, you just copy those in, put them into your, you know, your blind carbon copy up in your, uh, in your email, and it sends uh, emails out to your entire class. So the two ways that I have done it would, is through uh, emails, those guardian emails, but then also through a program called Class Tag. There's a lot of different programs out there. Class Tag is one. Remind, Class Dojo, they all have really great ways to contact parents and post things. I know, um, you know, it's, um, it's, it's whatever you are comfortable with. And, and hopefully at this point, you have some type of a communication set up with, with your parents and, and students. But oftentimes we don't. I've never emailed my students before this time. And so um, to have that tool from Empower Us has been extremely valuable. Um, we want to also invite that reciprocal, that reciprocal communication. I really want to hear things back from my parents. Uh, so I've been a really big believer always in uh, Google Forms and soliciting feedback, sending out surveys. Uh, I've sent out a lot of surveys and, uh, you know, you, you always want to make sure that if you're sending out a survey, you're okay with uh, the results that you actually get back. You'll see, um, this was, this was one here on the bottom, on the bottom right. So far, how do you feel about the amount of work your student has been getting? And I got three responses, just enough, or sorry, not enough, just right and too much. And, uh, what do you do with something like that? I, I don't know. So, uh, I think, um, eventually those three responses in and eventually, uh, it grew to be where it was, the work I was giving was just right. But, um, I think you have to ask. You really do. It's not enough to just wait and see how your students are doing because maybe your students are, are turning work in, but uh, it, at home it's really stressful. And I, and I think part of what I've been doing is looking for, uh, looking for parents to reach out and, and give me that temperature check for their students. Um, I've had some students turning things in, you know, eight o'clock and nine o'clock at night. And I, I've reached out to those parents and said, hey, you know, I'm noticing that, you know, Susie Q is turning stuff in pretty late is, um, you know, is, is, is everything going okay? Is this too much for you guys? And if we need to cut something back, but you're never going to find out unless you ask. I also have two parents that I've reached out to just yesterday to let them know that a student hasn't been turning things in. And um, I don't turn it, I don't really turn it into like a, hey, you know, gotcha moment, like, wow, your kid didn't turn something in. But it's more so like, hey, how's everything going over there? Um, you know, is the work too much? Are you doing okay? Do you need any support? And um, oftentimes uh, I've had a, yeah, you know, we're kind of stressing, but we're getting by things. Thanks for reaching out. Other times, the ones I got yesterday were, oh, interesting. Um, you know, little, little Johnny's telling me that they're doing the work and they're not. And so I think um, without that communication, obviously, we're not going to know. Uh, and, and parents aren't going to know either. I think right now parents are, are busy. They're doing, they're, they have so many things going on, right? And uh, maybe sometimes with their, with their older kids, the middle school, high school kids especially, you're, you're assuming that those kids are doing things on their own. And so um, sometimes your assumption, assumptions can need to come into check. Uh, communications with students is a, is a big one for me as well then. Uh, you know, if you have something going on or if you're trying to promote your classroom or if you have a change um, or maybe something pops up where you want to announce something, you have to have that, uh, that, that one spot, maybe, maybe two spots where you can reach out to the students where they always know, hey, I need to check this. I've had some teachers tell me that they are using email. So students every single morning want to understand an operating procedure. The students are supposed to just check an email 
get an update for the day, your daily agenda. Um, you know, uh, definitely Empower offers the, the messaging tool, so you can send out messages to students in class and you can communicate that way. I'm also a big believer, you know, with the Google Suite. We use Google Hangouts. I have, uh, I have probably a dozen different chats opened up uh, all at once, small groups. I have um, individual chats with students going on, and then I have a, a, a full class chat. I chose to definitely make sure that I had a full class chat because I think some students aren't the, the social types where they are going to reach out to other kids and, uh, and they might be that, you know, that, the shy kid in the corner. That shy kid in the corner is, is still the shy kid in the corner right now. They, they need somebody to reach out to them. And so um, as a teacher, I wanted to provide that. We're also, I'm soliciting daily feedback from my students. So I'm, I'm, uh, I've been doing a daily check-in now for the last couple of years where students come in even at school and they're filling out a Google form. How are you doing? I think a lot of students don't even get that usually in the morning. Um, so we do a daily check-in and that daily check-in for me is just a chance to see, you know, number one, how they're doing. I can also ask them, uh, you know, if, if they want me to reach out. Uh, this one, this, the second question is, do you want me to contact you today? Are you having any issues with your technology? Um, and then trying also to ask them some silly questions. I do a would you rather question every single morning on the daily check-in, um, just to try and get a, get a temperature check for the day and how my students are doing. And sometimes they'll be more likely to be honest on that daily check-in or through a Google form or through a message than they will maybe face-to-face Obviously, in your class meetings, there's, they might not want to talk. They might want to, um, to just be quiet and hope that you're reaching out to, to ask. So make sure you're doing that. So moving forward, then, if we have the kind of the, the, the basic setup of access and communication, um, I think it's really important for us not to forget some of these competency-based tools. Um, being a Marzano Academy, uh, this is definitely one of my strengths is, uh, is, is incorporating these things into our classrooms. And so we can still do this online. Now more than ever, uh, do we need a code of collaboration? Do we need to focus on the development of these collaborative skills and, and cognitive traits that our code provides? Um, we, at school, we, we developed one beginning of the year and um, we needed to update it. Obviously working at home is, is quite a bit different than being in a classroom. And so um, with, my, with my students, we, uh, through a series of about four or five different Google Forms, asking just some, some guiding questions, like I would in a classroom, the students came up with, uh, this is our code of collaboration here, in our online learning class, we will work to focus during work time, encourage our classmates, uh, help our families, and take breaks. Now, the, um, I kind of sectioned this off into four different categories. One was how students, uh, how can students be successful in their learning while they're at home? And we had lots of different things, you know, focus, set up a desk space. Um, there's, there's a, a million different, um, different tools that students can use to be successful. And there's videos out there for this. We've watched several of them as a class and uh, narrowed ours down to focus. Uh, but I also wanted to work on one that was social, collaborative. How, how can you um, how can help each other? And they thought that encouraging was, was going to be was going to be the strength here. The encouragement would, would be our class goal. Um, so to make sure that we are, you know, saying nice things to each other, helping each other, um, being positive and supportive. The third one that I really felt strongly about is how, how can you help out with your families at home? Um, a lot of our students uh, are probably maybe the oldest kid at home. And they can help out with the younger siblings. They can help out with the chores, those things that might take something off of a parent's plate. And so I've really promoted that in my classroom. We've done some work on that this week, even where I had students post examples and talk, talk about examples. I've gotten emails from parents with showing pictures of my students uh, you know, cleaning, loading a dishwasher, that kind of a thing. And we wanted to incorporate that into our code of collaboration. And then the last one was, how can you do something for yourself, which was take breaks. And, uh, you know, we talked about how it's good to, you know, work for a determined amount of time and take a break and talk about what to do on those breaks. And so they decided that would be our, our goal. Um, what we do after that, once, once we develop our code of collaboration is then we, uh, we, we write a rubric. It's nice to develop a rubric uh, that talks about what exactly does that look like, try and deliver lessons around these traits and uh, ultimately set individual and class goals. Uh, this is a part of our code of collaboration. Uh, sorry, the code of collaboration is a part of my daily check-in. So as students come in in the morning, you know, they're filling out the daily check-in for me. They're also telling me, they're also rating themselves on these four traits right here. Now, I think for older students, you know, middle school, high school students, these are, these are some of the traits that I think organizations right now uh, that are hiring people are looking for. These are some of those soft skills that we could teach them right now. This is a great opportunity for our students to get some real, um, like a uh, real world experience in, and online collaboration. I, I know a lot of us out there 
um, are are now thrust into this world, but man, the, the professional world out there, my wife included, uh, works mostly remotely. She works uh, for an IT organization, and uh, the skills that, that they are requiring for their employees are skills that we can embed in our students right now because we have this real world opportunity, we have this this chance. And so um, I think that could be a part of your code of collaboration, right? Um, is, is trying to push some of these things that um, might almost even be more important than some of the math or literacy lessons, some of those curriculum that we're actually teaching. Uh, standard operating procedures, another great competency-based tool. Um, I think you should check and see which ones you already have and if they can adapt for online learning. My students know what to do when they first come into class. So they uh, fill out the daily check-in and then they also do a, a, a fluency reading online all on their own. I, I still expect that same thing from my students every single morning. Uh, it's, it's adapted, it works. Um, I think uh, also, you know, there's some that need to get thrown out. The first meeting we had, one of my students said, Mr. Abbott, can I go to the bathroom? And I, we had a big talk about that. Talk about the SOP, uh, standard operating procedure behind that. Um, we, you know, it used to be at school, but we don't have to do that now. Um, just don't take the computer into the restroom is what I told them. Um, but ultimately, you have to build these standard operating procedures as needs arise. If you get something like, hey, how do you uh, seek help for your computer if you're having an issue? Um, how, how, do you, um, how do you go about turning in an item? If it's something, especially you know, if, if your students are new to online playlists through Empower, you, you're going to need to have maybe some, um, some, some instructional videos or a standard operating procedure developed that uh, shows students how to do some of these things. You can keep those in uh, a, a playlist. In, my, in our uh, online learning playlist, I have a nuts and bolts sub playlist where I have uh, links, I have the daily check-in, I have uh, SOP. And so uh, all those things should be available for students to access when you are not around because that's ultimately how this is working, that asynchronous learning. Um, uh, I think having a daily agenda for students, either one in a video where you're saying, hey, here's the steps to take today, or um, you know, maybe it's something that's written or an email um, is, is a good thing. But also the, the Empower Action Steps really do provide for a, a kind of a mini standard operating procedure to say, hey, here's, here's the steps you should take for this specific activity or for the specific goal that I want you to meet. And so um, that, those, those steps in there really does kind of take care of it for you. Uh, you know, down here, one, two, three, four, and uh, the students can access this and, and, and work through it on their own. Uh, normally in classroom, we would post all those things for, for uh, everyone to see. So like I said, you need to make sure they're in the playlist. And don't be afraid to retire one. If, if you have one that's worked well and students have got it, if you're trying to teach students how to log in through, uh, you know, their join a Google Meet or join their Zoom meetings, or maybe, you know, something that you've worked on for your code of collaboration even, which would be like online learning behaviors or digital citizenship. If that's gone well and you have a standard operating procedure that's for that, or you have, uh, you've identified that as part of your, of your code of collaboration and you've been successful and students have reached proficiency on that or given themselves a score three, uh, don't be afraid to retire that and move on to something else, something maybe perhaps more pertinent uh, to, to your circumstances that week or that month. Um, the last one that I, is, is kind of my, my um, cornerstone of, of, of competency-based education, which would be proficiency scales. And I think that it's really super important at this time to still make sure that we're continuing to center our instruction around these scales. Um, purposeful lessons are going to continue. And as a teacher, I want my students to understand that we're not just doing lessons willy-nilly so that I can keep them. Busy. And I'm not just going to throw something at them um, that, that, I, that doesn't matter. The work that we're doing right now still does matter. And if we're just taking slower baby steps, well, that's fine. Um, but we're still focused on, on certain, uh, you know, score two indicators, score three indicators. We're still focused on that. Um, my students, my students know that, uh, this is something we always have in class in their data notebooks. So we're actually having data folders now. I'm trying this out where my students, they do have access. I'm a big believer in making sure the students have access to these, these uh, proficiency skills. And not just through not just through Empower, but also maybe they, they have a, a copy of them, something they can mark up. And so um, this is something I developed for my class, these, these levels and the indicators and, and the students rate themselves on these score two indicators to score three indicators here. Uh, but students are, are keeping track of this and, and they're constantly in, in reflection and uh, reflection mode and goal setting mode then too. You know, which one are we wanting, wanting to work on today? Which one of these do you feel like is your strength? Which one of these, um, you know, do you want to, which one of these can you retire and move on? 
Uh, and so uh, all my students have these in their folders. Um, we're also making sure that we're continuing to celebrate. And so uh, I have this air horn that we play uh, when students reach proficiency. In the classroom, we have a bell in, in, in that the students would ring when they attain proficiency in a certain topic, um, when, they, when they get that 3.0 overall score. And so we're continuing to do that in class. We've done that just this last week because we're uh, rounding out a unit and moving on to something else. But I'm a big believer in celebration of those scales. Uh, classroom management, how, how do you manage a classroom that you're not in? Um, the, the first week that we were going, um, you know, you have some behaviors that you have to set up, things like uh, unmuting and chat spamming. Students, the students who seek attention in the classroom, they're still going to seek attention now. They're just going to go about it in different ways. Kids are innovative, man, and they're going to figure out a way to uh, to get attention if that's something that they're looking for. So, um, you know, how, how do you deal with that? Well, you, uh, it's the same way in school. It's the same way in school. Um, actually, I think I'm on the wrong slide here. Um, we number one, as you're delivering these these lessons, um, you have to make sure. I was sitting there. I think one time you pose a question, you don't hear anything, and um, one of my students started typing crickets in the chat, and I was like, "Yeah, that's kind of what I'm hearing too. It's just crickets." Uh, I'm wondering, is is anybody actually listening, and uh, is anybody actually learning? Um, What's going on? If, if you can't hear anything um, and, and you can't read faces and you can't see student behaviors, it's really hard to know if anybody's even out there. Um, and so what, what I needed was I needed those quick check tools. I really needed something that I could implement and do with my students that would give me immediate real-time feedback. Um, so I, I started using uh, Poll Everywhere within my uh, slides. So I would create a slide, uh, Google slide for um, my lesson, and then uh, Paul Everett has an integration tool. And so um, I was in, then able to get real-time feedback as I was going along. Uh, students were able to fill out a poll or answer a true-false question or um, or whatever. And all of a sudden, then I started I started realizing that, you know, yeah, my students are actually with me. But it, it also holds them accountable. Uh, you know, they if, if, if they know that they're going to be uh, forced to actually answer a question, then obviously they're going to be paying more attention. Um, I'm a big believer in, um, in random, uh, we, I do call on students randomly. I don't just do it uh, at the drop of a hat. I'll call randomly, maybe at the beginning of it. I'll say, hey, these five students, um, the, the randomizer has called on you. I call it the wheel of anxiety. Um, it, uh, it's called on you today. And uh, so I have you know, five students and I'll let them know, hey, I'm going to be calling on you, so be prepared. Uh, there's, there's some really cool, good tools out there though for this quick check, aside from Poll Everywhere. You know, Smart Notebook is a great place to do this. They have built-in polls. Uh, Cisco WebEx has built-in polls. Uh, Nearpod, I don't know if anybody out there is familiar with Nearpod, but it's a really great tool that you can upload your lessons into it and have uh, incorporate open, open-ended questions, draw it, matching questions, true, false, full, and the blank type things. Um, so as you're going along with the lesson, you can get that quick temperature check. And then um, obviously, you know, there's reactions within the Zoom. There's the thumbs up or the clapping. Um, Google Meet has something called an extension that is just released called Nod. It's the same kind of a thing. So you can at least get a thumbs up from students. Um, although that, you know, what does that mean? Uh, they're just following along with what everybody else has done. In, in the chat, sometimes I will have students put things in the chat, you know, hey, what, what was your answer to this question? But after, after three or four students put in one answer and it's all the same, then, the, you know, five, six, seven, eight kids know what to put on there and they're just going to put the same thing everybody else put on. So I'm a big believer in that, that poll everywhere uh, or Nearpod type experience but holding students accountable for everything for their learning while we're still going on huge challenge huge challenge um and then behavior uh we, we need to have these agreed upon norms and expectations uh, you just have to and, and it's just like in school um you hold them to high high standards hold them to have high accountability the first first day my my student who i'm sure everybody out there has that student uh unmuted and was playing his music really loud and um they had to had to kick that student out had to have a teachable moment with that student had to talk to that student um when you focus on those behaviors and those expectations and you shine a light on them and you and you show patience and understanding and, and have them as a teachable moment the students are capable of learning but it's definitely something you need to jump on right away uh my my first grade son when he first had his meeting uh it was I, it was difficult to sit there for the for the 10 minutes that was that his meeting was for. That was just a quick, can everybody get on? Because man, those kids were screaming and, and kids were jumping on and uh, mute unmute wasn't it wasn't an issue or was a huge issue. So um, I think if we take the time to train these students um, 
they, they can get it, but we have to have those agreed upon norms and expectations. I have an exit ticket my students take at the end of every lesson that just asks them questions like, how was your behavior during this lesson? Uh, do you feel like you were a good digital citizen? What's one thing you did well? What's one thing you can do better next time? So just kind of a quick um, exit ticket for behavior because ultimately that behavior and focus right now is, is kind of essential for our learning. I also, uh, I'm trying to still reward my students. Um, you know, this is definitely an elementary middle school thing that you can use things. I use class craft a lot. It's the one up here in the, in the middle there where students can build an avatar and uh, go on missions and those types of things. And I can reward them gold pieces and experience points. Um, class dojo, same thing for, for primary students. Um, I think for, for, you know, high school students, obviously this isn't going to work, but you can also reward them in different ways to, you know, you know I, I don't know, I, I created a Padlet here that you'll see where I have just some posting pictures of my students and just saying thank you, uh, trying to shower them with praise and show them how amazing I think they are, because they truly do. Um, I, I have never been a teacher who's afraid to tell my students that I love them. And now more than ever, I think it's important for us to do that, to show, show that love. Um, and, and, you know, ultimately if, um, if they're showing up and they have great behavior, um, I'm trying to let their parents know. I'm always a big parent communicator for the positives and not necessarily the negative. Uh, so I, I, I'm doing a, a one parent, a good parent communication phone call or, uh, or a chat message or whatever per day uh, to let those students who are showing up every, every day and working hard know that um, their, their effort is truly appreciated. Um, and then the last thing would be just kind of specials. How, how is specials? Uh, and SPED services and any other support service, how is that included in here? Um, I've had tried to have our custodian come on a couple times even. He was a, a really big integral part of our classroom in the morning. He would always stop by and say hi, and, uh, and he hasn't been there. So I've, I've asked him to come on to a couple chat meetings. Um, we've go went ahead and put um, student, uh, student playlists have been, uh, have been altered by the special teachers. We've given the special teachers access to that. So my PE teacher will come in and, uh, and put his activities into my playlist directly. Even though he has his own class in, in Empower, we kind of felt like having a one-stop shop for the students uh, was the most beneficial. So students are going through the, the, the weekly uh, playlist, which is what we, we've come up with. And we have days, you'll see uh, days built out here. So there's my sub playlist for Tuesday, for Wednesday, for Thursday, and for Friday. And then uh, Mr. Finn and my PE teacher went ahead and put his stuff right in there. He's also holding meetings. Uh, he'll pop into our meetings and then he'll also hold his own workout meetings. I think this is something that most schools have probably gotten down by now. But um, I think engagement on some of those uh, special specials meetings aren't quite as high as they could be. And so that once again goes around engagement Engagement and expectations um, are, are, are pretty super big things. But it's, the students really do like seeing uh, the other support staff that they come to know and see and love throughout the day that are all of a sudden gone. And I think um, the times that I've had these other teachers pop in, I don't know who is happier to be there, the, the specialist teachers or my students. And it, it, I think uh, as teachers, we need to see our students just as much as uh, they need to see us right now. Um, so my, my final thoughts on all of this, and I, man, I could go on for hours just talking about uh, online learning competency-based education, but the final thoughts are just to, to make it fun. Um, it, we had sock day. Uh, try just try to try to make this a fun experience as much as possible. Maybe give your students a place to um, to go where they, they don't have to worry about the things maybe that you're not aware that they're worrying about at home. Uh, you know, a lot of my students' um, parents are in the service industry, and I know that they're worried right now. And if I can provide my students a place to come to get their mind off of things, if, they, if I can have them focus on what kind of crazy socks they're going to wear or how they're going to do their hair or um, some debate that we're having, uh, just trying to make it fun is, is going to be huge uh, in order to be able to, to help my students social and emotional. Um, the, try and make it manageable. I think if you're, if you're giving way too much to your students, uh, that you're going to push them away and um, you, you risk not getting them back. I think uh, you know, for elementary, I've been thinking that around my, my grade five, six, I think if I can cut my expectations down to about 40%, 45% of what I would normally do in a classroom, I think is a, is a good number, it's about realistic. Um, lower you go, I think you gotta cut that even more so. And my brother, I was just talking to him, he's a high school AP um, history teacher, and he even said, to, you know, you really have to, even with very engaging students, very uh, go-getter students, you really still need to temper their expectations. Um, show the love. I, uh, one of my friends dropped off signs on every one of her students' lawns, uh, telling them how amazing that they were. 
um, trying to show your students love and, and, and let them know that, you know, that teacher that was always there for them is still there for them. And that hug that I, that I used to give you, I can't give you, I can give you in other ways. Um, and, and I think last but not least, show that patience and, and compassion and grace. And like I said, our students are kind of frightened little squirrels right now. Some of them or, uh, are timid or are not, um, maybe not as easy to engage right now. And we need to try to lure them in. Um, and, and just make sure that they know that we're still a part of their lives. So you can reach me, uh, anything that I have or you've seen on here, um, all my Google Forms, all of the code of collaboration, all that stuff, I'm, I am more than happy to share out uh, with anyone. My email is, is there, sabbat.westminsterpublicschool.org, and uh, you can also follow me on Twitter. But I really appreciate uh, getting the opportunity to be here and, uh, and uh, spend time with you. Um, these are, just one last slide, uh, I guess some of my favorite tech tools that I really couldn't, kind of go along without right now. I don't know what I would do without some of these tools. Uh, Padlet has been a huge thing for, for sharing socialization. Uh, quizzes and Kahoot uh, for, you know, just a different kind of formative assessment other than our Empower quizzes, which are, uh, which are awesome. I mean, first and foremost, guys, uh, of all these things, Empower, uh, I couldn't do anything without Empower right now. Um, Loom is a really good uh, screencasting. If, if you don't have a setup at home to, to record yourself, Loom, I think more better than Screencastify or any other tools that I've seen, uh, is, is by far the easiest to use and the most functional. Uh, Pull Everywhere and Nearpod, great for formative assessment. Flipgrid, great spot. If you haven't checked out Flipgrid, get over there. Uh, it allows students to record themselves. You can use this for responses, probing discussions. You can also just use it for students to share. Um, Classcraft, and uh, that's my, my classroom management tool. Class tag, my parent communication tool. Um, Zern and IXL are great for uh, for math. We also use Envisions right now for math. Uh, Wide Open School from, by, by Common Sense has uh, so many great um, so many great resources right now. Uh, online field trips, virtual field trips, tools, that type of stuff, uh, and uh, just some other fun things. Lucid Press and Tinkercad for for student demonstrations. So um, yeah, check them out. But I think I think you got to find what works for you. And, and this is stuff that we've been kind of using most of the year, and so we just kind of found different ways to use them. So uh, that's all I have. I think we can answer some questions though. Good deal. Thank you so much, Seth. That was awesome to just get a, 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 big, a big wide view of what's going on in your classroom and, and how you're engaging students and, and making them feel loved and appreciated. Um, so we, we do have a few questions. Um, the first one is that, um, uh, you mentioned a lot of different apps that you're using. How are you minimizing the number of applications you're having students use? Yeah, for sure. That, for them. Well, that can, and that can be, I think as a, as just a teacher going through the year, uh, in, even in school, you, you hear of all these great apps and you want to try them immediately and do them. Um, my, my students beginning of the year, I'm going to go back a slide. beginning of the year. We kind of, I roll out maybe one app every week. Um, and so I think if, if, if there's something, if your students aren't using a bunch of these, you obviously don't want to throw a bunch of them on them at, at, at one time. Um, I think pick one that you think you'll get the most bang for your buck out of and, uh, and try it out. My biggest advice for implementing of a new tool, I guess I have two things. One would be make sure that you're providing some kind of video support on either A, how to log in, how to create a login, what you expect students to do once you get there. I think a video tutorial from you, and it can be like a five minute video, is uh, super valuable. And then um, the, other, the other thing I think with all of these uh, online tools is to use it for fun first. So if you're having them create, uh, if you're having them go and you're gonna do a Kahoot, um, do a fun Kahoot, something that's just, that is not curriculum related at all. And try that, use that for fun. And uh, you can use that several times. I even do this with when we're doing, you know, knowledge maps in, in class um, or uh, Kagan structures. Use the Kagan structure for a fun thing before you use it for the curriculum. The same goes for a lot of these online tools. Good. All right. Our next question is, is it important that all teachers use the same meeting software across the district? Yeah, I, I, it's, that's a really tricky one. I think it is. I think it's helpful if they do. We currently do not. And I do have some students um, who I think initially had an issue jumping from Zoom to Google Meet. Uh, I think as long as, like I said, as long as teachers are training students, and as long as you're showing them a video on how to access it, um, older students especially can, can understand that. I think also too, if you're just providing links to the meetings, if, if all you're doing is creating a resource within an Empower playlist, 
uh, and that, that resource is just a direct link to the meeting, that's not going to matter so much. For the most part, they're all, they're all relatively similar, right? Mute, unmute, um, format might look a little bit different, but as long as, you know, as long as your district's maybe using one or two, that works out well. I, I know some districts have, have isolated ones that they're going to use. I know some districts in my area have, have said, you know, Zoom is not an option because of the security features, and so they're going to use kind of what they have. Um, it's definitely something to think about. Good. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. How much one-on-one -on -one time are you giving to students, if any? Yeah, I have I have um, hours, uh, office hours. I'm calling them on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And more of the, more of the one on one uh, attention my students are getting from me is through uh, just a Google Chat. Um, I do I do have I have downloaded the app onto my phone so that um, you know I have four kids, and so if I'm out in the backyard and I'm or I'm, I'm you know I'm dealing with helping my son with homework or whatever, it's really tough for me to jump on and do a face to face chat. And I think some of my students are feeling the same way. I, I tell you, one of the things, Sean, that I, that I don't do is I don't require my students to show their cameras when we are meeting. I know I've seen some, some teachers that are doing that. I've seen some students requiring students to be at a desk. My, my students don't have that luxury. A lot of my students are in their bedrooms because that's the only place in the house where they can get some peace and quiet and focus. Um, and so I think a lot of my students are self-conscious to show their, show their cameras. So um, I've, I have given one-on-one -on -one through phone calls, uh, I've helped parents with phone calls, I've helped parents through chats. Um, some of those students, some of your students are go-getters and they're not gonna need it. Um, and some of your students really need more support than anything else. So it's, uh, I think it's just as a, a as-need basis and, and student by student. Uh, you know, luckily this is kind of the end of the year and we know our students pretty well. And so I think you know the students that you're gonna need to follow up with. Um, and, you know, I've, I've also, we've done, this is a long answer, I'm sorry. I know we've done uh, small group meetings as well. I've set up small groups with my students. So those on those days where I want them to meet as a small small group and I'm coming in with them in the Google Google Hangouts, um, I'll make maybe my our meeting a little bit a little bit shorter. And so I'll say, hey, today, you know, I'm going to come in. I want to be with you guys for five minutes as a small group um, and, and help them kind of lead a chat that they're having. So I... These, I don't think there's any right answer, honestly, for any of the stuff that we're doing. Um, I think it really all kind of depends on your situation and uh, and your students and what works. If you find something that's working, go with it, right? Um, and if you find if there's a need, you gotta try and fill that need. And uh, and oftentimes technology is the way to do that. Good. Well, it's it's nice to hear um, a, a vision of how you are doing it. So although there there might not be one right way to do it, it's mm -hmm. it's nice to have a, a concrete. Uh, vision of that. So, um, uh, Seth, would you mind just advancing one slide instead of yeah, yeah, sure. back and forth? Uh, yeah, we go one more. So, um, folks, that that wraps up our day. I hope that this was helpful to you. Uh, we did record the session today, or are recording the session, so you feel free to share this with others. We will be providing it to you over email, uh, as well as posting it to um, uh, at Empower CVE. Uh, as well on, on Twitter and as well as our Facebook site. So um, my contact info is right there. If anybody has any questions about anything, uh, some way that we can potentially help you, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, Seth provided his contact info a few slides ago. If, uh, if you just need a way to, to connect with him because you didn't get the, the email written down in, in time, uh, just shoot me an email and I will connect you with Seth. So. With that said, from all of us here at Empower Learning and um, on behalf of Seth, I'll just say it for him. Um, thank you so much for all of the work that you're all doing out there. Um, I know you're working hard in this uncertain time and everything that you're doing for, for students is genuinely appreciated. So thanks so much for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.